Thanks, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Aaron Silverstein, the CEO and co-founder of Owlized. We're a time travel company. <clears throat> um, before I kind of dive into some of the projects that we've kicked off recently with national parks, let me just kind of set the stage. What we're really interested in is the fact that humans, about a billion people, every year travel internationally to historic sites like this. This might look familiar to some of you, the USS Arizona, Pearl Harbor. And of those billion people, the number one category of activity among travelers is cultural heritage. We go to places like this to understand who we are by understanding our past. And so you go to a place like Pearl Harbor, you might see a sign like this. It's kind of the original AR. Sort of matches up. And we'll use whatever tools we can to understand the gravity and the significance of these places that we cherish. The problem is, if you're standing there on the edge of Battleship Row and you're looking out over the water, what you don't see are the planes in the sky. You don't see the ships on fire sinking to the bottom of the harbor. If you really want to feel like you are there witnessing these historic experiences, what you really need is a time machine. And so that's what we have built. This is OWL VR, uh, that you're looking at an alpha prototype. Uh, and there's a number of other companies that are starting to play in this space as well. And it's what we often refer to as locational reality, because it isn't quite VR, it isn't quite AR. It's converging VR in place in order to literally augment reality, but not it's not AR. It's not overlaying model data over a real-time video feed. It's not sensing in real time what the surrounding environment is doing. Everything is pre-produced in order to create a much more believable time travel experience. AR is great. It's informative. It's interesting. But it isn't time travel. It doesn't transport you. If you're standing there on the edge of Battleship Row and you're seeing this story right before your eyes and you're looking around in all directions, you actually feel like you're there. And in this way, we can bear witness to the events that define us so that we can never forget. We're the first company to bring this technology to a national park. This is Pearl Harbor. Um, <laughs> we hadn't quite finished even installing them before kids started running up and using them. And if you're wondering sort of, you know, why not mobile? Why not do this on either a tethered system, mobile VR? The answer is simple. For tourism, for this market, which is one of the biggest unaddressed markets in VR, you, people don't travel with gear. I don't know about you, but when I travel, I try to pack as light as I can. Very few people are going to be lugging around a $1,500 VR rig or even a Google Cardboard when they travel. And these devices are simply just not meant for this use case. They're meant for gaming, for entertainment, for one person, you, in your home, in your living room, having some sort of socially isolated experience with whatever content. It's essentially the matrix versus what we're doing, which is as opposed to trying to create a completely alternate reality, we believe that VR can be best used to interpret and make sense of and connect emotionally with the real world. So there's a few, as I mentioned, there's a few companies doing this. Uh, we're owlized. There's a company in Paris called Timescope. They're really interesting. They've got a couple similar type devices uh, deployed right now. One of them is on the banks of the Seine. And if you look through, you can see the history of that place. Uh, they also have one in front of the historic location of the Bastille. And you can watch the storming of the Bastille. Uh, and these are very early days. There's no one else in this country that I'm aware of that is bringing this platform to market. Um, and I think it's worth noting that, in a, at least in this recent survey, this was um, Market Week, they surveyed the general public. They just asked the question, what would you use VR for if you could use it for anything, open-ended? And they weren't polling early adopters. They were just asking everyday people. And the number one response was travel and adventure. Number six on the list 
is gaming. So I have to wonder, of this $150 billion potential market, and some say it's much higher, what percentage of that opportunity is going unrealized because everyone is so myopically focused on gaming and live streaming and entertainment? I think there's a really, really big opportunity here. The business model for these kinds of devices, and this, you know, there will be more, uh, is transactional. You walk up, choose your payment method, scan your phone, swipe your credit card, and watch the show. And each show, each experience is a two minute, 360 degree VR video. Right, so we're, not, we're, we're kind of moving away from, and what I'm gonna talk about now, uh, are, uh, we're moving away from a game world experience to simply VR video. Uh, and so I'm gonna talk about so the lessons we learned in Pearl Harbor, what it takes to produce content for a specific site so that the experience is truly in situ, so that you feel like you're there in that place root with your feet rooted on the ground, but in a different moment in time. And then how we actually interpret whatever archival material is available to create these stories. This is what you will see if you go to Pearl Harbor today and you look through the owl, right? So this will look familiar to any of you Unity folks. It's a Unity app. And it, it's cool. You can look at, you know, there's a navigational menu and you can look at these different stages of the attack. Uh, we, we are not content producers. This platform is open to anyone to produce content, and we offer a revenue stream for content producers. Uh, so we didn't make this app. Um, if we did, we would have made it animated, and we would have included sound. But point being, the user, because the user is looking around in all directions and exploring and discovering, there's no way to really gate the experience. There's no way to control the flow of users through. As opposed to video, you can very carefully gate each session. It's just simply the duration of the video. So at the end of the day, what the platform offers is either app playback or video playback on a player that we develop. So we think that's going to be a game changer. Right now, we are only supporting 360 video, 3D video. Uh, we're not supporting Unity apps anymore. Um, because this business model requires a, a heavy flow of users through these machines. We usually deploy multiple, multiple devices in one place. So if you look at Pearl Harbor, this is the number one most visited destination in Hawaii. And not to put too fine a point on it, but I think that the fundamental difference between what companies like ours are trying to do with VR and everyone else is that rather than trying to bring people to our product and pay that high cost of user acquisition, we're just dropping these in the middle of the most densely populated and visited destinations on Earth. It's essentially a real estate grab. Once they're installed, you don't even need to market them because people are already there to spend money. So we're seeing about 15 people per unit per hour using these devices, and over 50,000 people have used them in the, just the first few months. So I mentioned Game World not working. I mean, it, it works, but I think it's kind of, it works as a prototype, as an experiment. Um, it is more interactive, you, but then you have to explain to people how to use it. And if you're dealing with the general public, it has to be super intuitive. 360 video is simple, you just walk up and use it. It requires zero instruction. Anyone can figure it out, especially because you're dealing with a form factor that's familiar if you've ever used the old coin-operated uh, binoculars. So how do you produce content that exactly matches the surrounding environment? This is a process that we've developed since 2014, and it requires a kind of a mix of skill sets. Um, you can't just be a really talented CG artist. You have to know something about reading uh, digital elevation models. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. But the key here is that the content has to perfectly match. It has to feel like AR in a sense, or else it interrupts the experience of time travel. It, it's not as convincing. So this is the process, six steps. You choose your site, you collect whatever available data is out there floating in the ether, and there's usually plenty. 
Then you shoot a 360 degree photographic backplate. Import that into a 3D model that you then build out with massing models and then you composite the story layer on top. I'll go through these, but just, I'm just quick overview here. And then you output the final animation as a 360 video. So for any given site, these are the key criteria. You want to put them in places where there's a lot of foot traffic. You want to have a really good story to tell. And obviously, it's got to be on flat ground. There has to be available power and internet. Every one of these devices is on the cloud, so we can actually push content remotely and update whenever our clients want to. We're talking, for example, to um, Golden Gate National Recreation Area. That's the national park that includes the Golden Gate Bridge. They're really interested in having a story showing the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge, but then maybe a year later swapping it out for like an earthquake story. So these are the three kinds of data sets that we most regu regularly work with. Um, if anyone here has experience doing civil engineering, these will look familiar to you, digital elevation models. LIDAR, if it's available, increasingly it is, and terrain models. So collect that, put that aside. Then we go to the project site, you shoot a series of stills. Um, if you've never done this before, it's relatively straightforward. You can either shoot these with a 360 camera, or what's better is to use a DSLR camera, put it on a tripod, and you shoot a series of stills, and then stitch them together into a sphere. So then when you go to build your model, you're starting by importing those digital elevation models, terrain models, whatever the existing condition uh, looks like per the data that you've acquired. And then you import that photo sim and align it so that it matches the perspective of the, of the terrain model. And that's how, you have, that's how you build out the existing condition. And so with that in place, you can start compositing the story. How much time do I have? About 30 seconds. <laughs> OK. All right, I'm going to skip ahead here then. Um, so once you've finished compositing the story, you output it as a 360 video, it's just a standard format. And we load it in the device, and it plays when the user uh, triggers the content. Uh, what I don't have time to talk about is how we actually produce the story. I'd be happy to chat with you about that one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but the long and short of it is you want to find local experts in every market. Go to the source, find your archival photographs, your maps, anything that you can to create that story. Sit down with the guru. This guy is in every historic site in the world. There's, a guy, there's somebody like this. And they, this person doesn't see the light. They're, they never have these, these kinds of opportunities to share the stories with the public. Storyboard it, script it, go back and refine it until it's perfect. It's essentially like making a movie. I'll just close with this. Um, this is a project we finished in downtown Napa. This is, what, this is just a snapshot of what, the, uh, what it looks like today. And this is what it looked like 120 years ago. Of course, in the OWL, you know, it's 360 with audio. So thank you so much for your time. Um, if you're, any of you are content creators, I'd love to talk to you about partnering, helping you create a revenue stream for your work. Thank you so much. Awesome.